This is CBC Here and Now. If all continues to go well, Halloween will be a go. More on that coming up on Here and Now. You still have time to get your costume. I asked, are you so ignorant that you think you'll live forever, or are you so selfish that you don't care what happens after you die? Hundreds rally for today's climate strike in St. John's. I mean, this is cruel and unjust to put someone through a third trial, and I'm not sure personally that I could do it. Weeks of evidence and deliberation undone. Reaction to today's mistrial. Welcome to Hearing Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain, and that's our top story tonight. A shocking development at an assault trial in St. John's. Yesterday, the jury was sent off to decide a verdict in RNC officer Doug Snellgrove's sexual assault trial, and only two outcomes were expected, guilty or not guilty. But earlier today, the trial moved in a different direction and ended without any verdict at all. Here now is Malone Mullen has that story. It was here at Supreme Court that Doug Snellgrove would have been convicted or acquitted of sexual assault in the coming days. Instead, earlier this morning, he was sent home. A mistrial declared by Judge Garrett Handrigan earlier today, effectively erasing the past two weeks of evidence and deliberations. The jury had already heard from witnesses and began deciding their verdict yesterday, armed with careful instructions from Handrigan. At the first trial, the judge erred giving those instructions. That's why the verdict was overturned. Now, for the second time, the judge made a grave mistake. Here's what happened. Handrigan had retained 14 people for the jury instead of the standard 12, in case any jurors dropped out of the trial as it proceeded. The final 12 should have been decided by a lottery system. Instead, Handrigan dismissed the last two jurors chosen. Defense counsel called the mistake an unfortunate but fatal error and said in a statement that a mistrial was the only solution. Crown counsel had lobbied to simply reselect the jury with the lottery system, but Handrigan decided the trial could not be salvaged. It's a far cry from the results of the last trial in 2017, when the jury decided they hadn't heard enough evidence to convict. That acquittal sparked protests outside the Supreme Court and police headquarters, with supporters of sexual assault survivors rallying for the complainant. This time around, no decision was reached. Crown intends to seek a new trial for Snellgrove at his arraignment on October 5th, but said hearing evidence for the third time might be difficult for the complainant to bear. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Now, a third trial, as Malone mentioned, would likely mean making the complainant testify for a third time, and women's rights activist Jenny Wright thinks that's unacceptable. She says this trial should have gone ahead and that the justice system could have found a workaround to prevent making the complainant relive what happened with Snellgrove yet again. This is where the system is broken. This is where the system really harms victims. If you weigh the balance of how that might affect the validity of the trial, the validity of all that testimony over the incredible harm a third trial is going to do uh, to that victim, to, to pub, uh, the public sense of safety and in the public interest, and in terms of costs. It, it absolutely makes no sense, and it has absolutely nothing to do with justice in this case. Analysis from Jenny Wright, including her take on how the Snell Grove case will affect survivors in the future. That's ahead on Here and Now. Well, the federal government is writing a check for the oil industry. It announced $320 million today. Let's bring in here and now's Peter Cowan to break it down. So, Peter, where will this money go? Basically, the federal government is just handing this money over to the province, very few strings, and saying, figure out the best way to spend it. Now, it does have a few ideas about where it wants that money to be spent. Uh, it's the first priority is going to be protecting the jobs of workers. The second is lowering greenhouse gas emissions. The federal government says the money is coming from the profits it's received over the years from its investment in the Hibernia offshore oil field. Seamus O'Regan, the federal minister making the announcement today, made it clear this is to help workers. Ottawa is not going to provide incentives for oil and gas exploration. Incentives are a subsidy, and we ran on a mandate of no subsidies for oil and gas companies as a political party. How is this $320 million not a subsidy for the industry, though? 
This $320 million comes from our dividend, it, and certainly what we're doing here is applying it to workers, making sure that we get them back to work in the same way that we did uh, with Orphan and Inactive Wells out west. Uh, and I think that, frankly, um, when we, we as a government, and I've had many conversations with the Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change about this, um, when we help companies lower emissions, regardless of what their company is or their industry is, that is not a subsidy for us. Now, the province is putting in place a task force to help make the decisions about who gets the money. The Premier said today he doesn't want delays, he wants to see that money out the door quickly. But what does this do for the oil and gas industry? It is going to be a help, but the, in an industry that talks in billions, millions is really only a start. Spreading this out equally and achieving nothing is not ideal. I think these need to be strategic investments and we need to stretch this money and leverage it as far as we can. Is it going to solve all the problems? Uh, we've been, it's not death by, death by a thousand cuts, it's been death by billions of dollars. So it would certainly take more money than today to solve all of the problems. Now, one of the problems that we've heard from is Husky and its West White Rose expansion, which is on hold. They're asking for more money than this announcement today just for one project. And we heard the minister say today he has been in talks with Husky. They're trying to find creative ways to move forward. But Husky said the announcement today does nothing for their reconsideration of this project. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, not everyone is thrilled with today, today's announcement. The PC late leader says the money is too little, too late. There's 20,000 families out there in this province who should be angry about this announcement. It's not putting anybody back to work on Monday or even a month from Monday or even three months from Monday since they've got 90 days to decide how to spend the money. When I spoke to the jobs rally at Confederation Building last week, I reflected back to the people who were there that I knew what they wanted. They wanted jobs, they wanted jobs, and they wanted jobs. There's nothing in this announcement that's going to get them that anytime soon. Well, from oil and gas to environmental activism, hundreds marched in St. John's today calling for action in the fight against climate change. Across the globe, Fridays for Future, a movement started by young activist Greta Thunberg, organized climate strikes at local parliaments and city halls. Here now's Mark Quinn was at today's rally. More than 200 climate strikers marched to the Colonial Building this afternoon. They want action to tackle climate change, and they say they represent many people who feel the same way. We really are here to show that we're a large part of the population. You know, I'm 19, I voted in the past two elections, and this is an issue that's on our minds, and this is something that's a big priority for us. Some want to stop oil production altogether right now. Others say we need to transition away from fossil fuels more slowly. So it's really disheartening to see exploration and continuing to grow the oil industry when we know that it's a finite resource and we really need to be shutting it down, moving towards a, a green future. The climate strikers were mostly young adults and students. One speaker asked older adults why they aren't doing more. I asked, are you so ignorant that you think you'll live forever or are you so selfish that you don't care what happens after you die? The new Provincial Minister of Environment and Climate Change and Municipalities also spoke at the rally. He was challenged repeatedly by members of the audience. <laughs> and confronted directly by one of them. If your kids can't go out and fish, we're a fishing island and your kids can't go out and fish. You're telling me that you can sleep well at night. That's not accurate. My, my daughter and I was out fishing just a few weeks ago during the cod fishery. She can't get no commercial fishing license and make a living now, can she? She's not a commercial fisher now. No, no, nobody in New Plan can be because you guys gave it up. We, there is a lot of work to do, I agree. The event ended with a performance by Tim Baker. Oh my God, thank you everybody. Thanks for coming here. Thanks for leaving class and doing it. This rally wasn't as big as some of the past climate strikes in this province, but the organizers promised they'll be back and will continue to demand change. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, teenage environmental activist Greta Thunberg and fellow demonstrators staged a protest in front of Sweden's parliament today. The crisis has never once been treated as a crisis, and unless we treat it as a crisis, we won't be able to 
so-called solve it. Young activists around the world are taking part in a series of protests. The 16-year-old Thunberg began the Fridays for Future movement in 2018. Thunberg received her second consecutive Nobel Peace Prize nomination earlier this year. lovely afternoon certainly here in the east we saw temperatures climbing into the high teens and then a little bit cooler as we headed towards the west coast earlier this afternoon and some flurries for lab city this afternoon as well now as we head through the next couple of days these winds unfortunately are going to stick around for most of us and then we look ahead to next week where we do have some warmer temperatures on the way i'll break all of that down for you when i come back Thanks, Ashley. Nice glow out there. Nice night for a walk. And we all might be doing a bit of walking in the St. John's area because Metro bus workers may go on strike starting on October the 5th. They've rejected a contract offer from the city of St. John's, and that happened last night. If the sides don't come to a deal before the 5th, the transit service is going to stop, and riders are going to have to find some other way to get where they're going. Benefits are the main sticking point. The union is pushing for the same kind of severance deal that other city workers have, which is one week's pay for every year of service. The city says it just can't afford it. Anaconda Mining has fired an employee for making racist and homophobic social media posts. The man who listed Anaconda as his employer online commented, White Lives Matter on an anti-Black Lives Matter post. When a former classmate called him out on it, the employee apparently started in with more slurs, and that's when the classmate reported the behavior to his employer. Anaconda Mining is based in Bay Vert, while the company would not confirm that it fired the man when reached by CBC News. A spokesperson cited its respectful workplace policy and different disciplinary actions, including termination. Family members of the employee have posted on Facebook that the situation has caused the employee emotional and financial distress. Well, police are warning of a second possible case of child luring. On Sunday, RCMP say a man in an older red Chevy car drove past a young boy in Buren and asked him if he wanted a ride. The boy ignored the driver at first and then ran to a family member's driveway when the car spun around and headed back towards the boy. Three days earlier in Bishop's Falls, police say two men asked a young girl walking up Main Street what her name was and they told her that they had something for her. They were in a rusting gray or silver pickup that had a dent on the passenger door and then the pair allegedly drove off when the girl didn't respond. Police are urging parents to talk to their children about not accepting rides from strangers. Well, watch what you toss. That's what the city of St. John's says. It's asking people to keep hazardous household waste away from the landfill. Otherwise, this happens. There have been 31 fires in less than two years at Robin Hood Bay Dump, according to the city. Things like lithium ion batteries, marine flares, and some household chemicals like pool chemicals can combust when crews compress the trash. That fire can be dangerously unpredictable. The city is asking people to properly dispose of those things so there's a smaller chance of fire. The province set out some guidelines today for how trick-or-treaters can stay safe during Halloween. Earlier this week, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald announced Halloween is a go this year because of the low number of COVID cases in this province. Now, some people are already getting into the Halloween spirit. Here and now's Heather Gillis has that story. COVID-19 can be scary, but the pandemic hasn't claimed the spookiest night of the year. And that's exciting news for Ninja Ewan Abbott. Yeah, I'm, I'm more excited than right usually because it's because of COVID. Happy Halloween! The Abbott, Parfrey, and Yetman kids are already excited about picking out their favorite costumes and picking up all that candy. My favorite part is trick-or-treating with my friends. I like it when I get a Wonder Bar. I like candy, so that's what I like about Halloween. Candy! <laughs> Today, the Department of Health released guidelines about how best to handle Halloween this year for those handing out treats. No taking part if you're sick or self-isolating. Consider posting a no visitor sign instead. Remember to wash your hands, consider wearing a mask and individually wrapping treat bags. And drop treats into kids' bags to avoid many hands in one candy bowl. 
For ghouls and goblins, stay home if you're feeling sick or isolating. Wash your hands before you leave the house when you get home and before eating any treats. Respect homes not taking part this year. Try trick-or-treating with your bubble. Remember to distance and take turns at houses. A non-medical mask isn't necessary for outdoor trick-or-treating, but is if you're inside, like in an apartment building. And of course, no high-risk activities, like bobbing for apples. While many parts of the country are experiencing a second wave of COVID-19, mom Carla Parfrey is happy the case number here is low. Both my kids were in lockdown for their birthdays, so I think for this holiday to go ahead, it means probably more than even myself as an adult can understand. It's pretty special and I'm happy it's going ahead for them. Angela Power says this year they may stick a little closer to home. Oh, uh, we've thought a lot about keeping um, our Halloween distance to just close family, friends on nearby streets, um, but particularly with people we know. In addition to trick-or-treating, the guidance also says corn mazes, haunted houses and pumpkin patches can also go ahead this Halloween season. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Tonight on Here and Now, we'll get a very close look at the beautiful trails around Deer Lake. It's a trail that's cleaned up well. It's got, uh, it's almost got a, like a park view to it. ATV use, walking trails, just stunning views around this West Coast community. That's coming up. Well, it's looking like a nice weekend to use some of those trails as we head into the last weekend of September. Even better as we head into next week. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up.
Welcome back. For five straight summers, Deer Lake has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to upgrade its trail system. And it's a multi-purpose trail that's used by walkers and cyclists, as well as ATV and side-by-side -side enthusiasts. And the trail runs right around the whole town. Here now joined, here and now joined an ATV convoy today and managed to get a tour from one of the men who maintains that trail. Well, we're right here now on our walking trail, the line side of Deer Lake. And this is the Humber River Trail that uh, we designed probably five years ago. Uh, it was uh, first started out to be a walking trail. Uh, we put uh, a lot of effort into it to get it like it is to now today. It uh, seems like uh, now they want a multi-purpose trail. So the last few years we've been focusing more on multi-purpose. We're trying to make it so they can use ATVs and snowmobiles and also walk besides. I, I think it's the nature side of it. I think it's the big timber. It's the actual river side of it, walking through. It's a, it's a trail that's cleaned up well. It, it's got, uh, it's almost got a, like a park view to it. It's all, uh, the, the topping that we put on, the chips that we put on, make it really nice for walking for your legs and everything. So people really enjoy it, runners and uh, just walkers and that. So it's unique, uh, there's not a lot of trails we really didn't know how this was going to work it when we started, and we tried these chips to see, and man, they work real well. So, And uh, our effort this year was to, what we're doing now is a little tour. We're trying to make it so that it's connected this year, and then uh, I was telling you earlier, there's a three-year program to make it. This is stage one, and this trail is uh, our stage three, but the rest of the trail we're on our view today will be probably stage one, and then by the third, stage we'll have it like it should be. I'm a bit of the QC guy, I like the quality control, I like it uh, to be uh, really presentable, really nice, so uh, we're going to keep it there. You will, you come back now in three years time, you'll see the difference of what it is today and what it will be in, uh, in three years time, two years time. Yeah. I think the people think it's great. The comments we get on the trail, that's what keeps us going. When we're working and the people walk along, and excellent job, a good job, and thank you very much. And this is what promote us, that's what make us work hard. Absolutely. So, yeah. Are you proud of it at the end of the day? Oh, I'm proud of it, yeah. I'm a, I'm a Bush guy too, so. Right, thanks to Colleen Connors, she put that item together for us. Looks like uh, quite the spot for the fall. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Ashley's here now with a look at the weather. And Ashley, when we saw you outside earlier, it looked so nice. You had this beautiful golden <laughs> glow as the sun was setting out there, but it seemed a little bit windy. It was very windy. Yes, uh, sun's uh, just about to set. And with that, I guess it's about 12 hours of daylight today or mm -hmm. fall equinox is official. But uh, yeah, temperatures today were absolutely beautiful. 17 degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's. We did see those cooler temperatures, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, towards the West Coast and certainly up through Labrador. About four degrees was your afternoon high in Lab City today, and we're currently sitting at three degrees with those temperatures dipping uh, into the teens for most of the island. Now, not a whole lot going on today. We did see some cloud cover a little bit earlier today, but that's all cleared for the east. We do have a few showers popping up as well along the west coast and then plenty of cloud cover and then even some flurries uh, being recorded in Lab City earlier this afternoon. Not a whole lot happening though as far as we head through the next uh, through the evening hours tonight. We do have that cold air wrapping around though. That's what's uh, bringing all that cooler air up through Labrador and then even through parts of the West Coast as well. But as we head through the night tonight, we're looking at the potential for a few showers, certainly for the Northern Peninsula. Same thing up through Labrador. A slight chance of a few more flurries for Lab City, then you should actually start to see your skies clear as you head into the early morning hours. We might see those showers make their way towards central as well, but shouldn't amount to much as far as that's concerned. And then these winds are going to stay breezy as well. So we're looking at wind gusts across the island anywhere from 40 to as much as 50 kilometers per hour out of the west. Temperatures dipping into those single digits. Hovering around the zero degree mark for Lab City up through northern portions of Labrador, though you're looking at northwesterlies 
upwards of about 50 kilometers or uh, 50 to 70 kilometers per hour as far as those winds go but uh, overall your temperatures will be sitting in the single digits now tomorrow that ridge of high pressure that uh, is going to dominate is going to keep things for the most part fairly quiet we might see some cloud cover move in towards the end of the day uh, along the west coast and you'll start to see some showers developing for uh, western portions of Labrador and then spread towards central Labrador as we head into the evening hours and we'll see some of those showers as well for parts of the northern peninsula uh, and then eventually towards the coast northern areas you'll probably uh, see some wet flurries with this one as well. Overall temperatures will be beautiful tomorrow, uh, 16, 15, 16 degrees, but again, those winds staying breezy. We're going to stick around for a little while. We're looking at gusts anywhere from 50 to as much as uh, 60 kilometers per hour in some areas, but plenty of sunshine, like I mentioned. Uh, same thing for Labrador, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 12 degrees before you start to see that rain move in and your winds in the west will be anywhere from 20 to as much as 40 kilometers per hour. Now it is the last weekend of September as we head into the end of September. We're generally falling into fall, however, uh, with those temperatures, you know, down to about 13 degrees is the daytime high. Normally is the average daytime high for St. John's. Uh, cooler, obviously, up through Labrador. But uh, that is not the case as we head into the end of next week. Here's where our, or the end of the weekend, rather. Here's where our temperatures will be sitting on Sunday into the 20s. It's going to feel very much like summer. Plenty of sunshine on tap. We will see some showers, though, make their way towards the northern peninsula, hovering around the teens, and then single-digit highs for Happy Valley Goose Bay back up to 12 degrees for Lab City, and then Nain, you're sitting in the 5-degree mark. Monday, not much different. Temperatures are actually going to continue to climb as well, and again, we've been talking about it for the last couple of days. Thanks to where that jet stream is, allowing all of that uh, warm air to move up from the south, but it will be a little bit more unsettled as we head into Monday. Uh, certainly along the west coast, a few showers potentially as well for parts of eastern, uh, eastern Newfoundland as well. And then back up to 15 degrees for Lab City for you on Monday. The other thing to note though is even though we're going to see these temperatures uh, mild into the 20s, the Humidex Valleys, this is the dew point, and once we start to get into the 12, 14, 16, that's when we start to feel that humidity in the air, and that's certainly going to be the case Monday. Even looking ahead into Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to see these Humidex Valleys uh, anywhere from 25, maybe 26, 27, uh, feeling like that with the Humidex. So certainly not fall, feeling very much like summer for the majority of us, that's for sure. Over the next couple of days, here's your temperatures. I think you'll like them. 20 degrees as our afternoon highs and overnight lows into those teens. Again, that's where we should be sitting as our daytime highs around this time of year. Not a whole lot of weather to talk about. We're looking at uh, maybe a few showers, like I said, on Monday, but otherwise Tuesday and Wednesday, just some increasing cloud through the day. Now for central Newfoundland, it looks like we'll see some showers for Wednesday and then uh, western Newfoundland a little bit more on the unsettled uh, point of view, but you are looking at, uh, again, temperatures in the 20s, so it will feel quite lovely. Uh, for eastern Labrador, you're looking at temperatures potentially up into the 18 to 21 degree range for both Monday and Tuesday, and then dipping as we head into Wednesday. And then uh, teen temperatures, the case for uh, western Labrador, overnight lows don't really dip into those single digits until we get into the middle of next week wanted to share this beautiful shot. Speaking of the big land, Happy Valley Goose Bay, a uh, colorful sky there. Thank you so much to Amanda for sharing that with us. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Welcome back to Here and Now. Major story today, the Snell Grove case, a mistrial for the disgraced RNC constable. So here we go again. Uh, Jenny Wright is a women's activist who's been on here now many times. What do you make of this latest turn in a trial that never seems to end? This is shocking and, and uh, we're outraged as advocates that this has happened. This trial had a huge significant impact on, its, on this community. We have been watching it since 2017. Uh, hugely impactful, not just because of the horrific nature of the crime, but because the perpetrator was an on-duty police officer who was uniform, who was in a uniform and had a weapon at the time. This speaks to our entire judicial system, whether we feel safe going to the police when we've been harmed, whether the court system will give us justice and supports that we need, that we will be heard, and whether or not services 
uh, that are in place for women are actually working. Right now, we're seeing somewhere between only 2 and 8% of sexual assault victims coming forward. Uh, th that's a huge concern because if only 2 or 8% of women are coming forward, that means our communities are literally uh, full of perpetrators. As far as the woman at the centre of this case goes, this is this will be the third time she's going to have to restart this. What's this like for her? This is cruel and unjust to put someone through a third trial, and I'm not sure personally that I could do it. What we hear from women going through this type of trial is that it takes a huge toll on their mental health. So we're hearing of women who are facing mental health, facing addictions, also huge financial losses about being able to, to, to work, the cost of leaving Legal, uh, legal services is absolutely outrageous. And it's something that doesn't just go away when the trial is over. It stays with women. It affects them for multiple, multiple years. Um, and women tell us at the end of it, there was no justice. That if they were to do it again, they wouldn't go through that system again. And we simply just can't have a justice system that harms women in this way. We have asked several times for changes within the system because it is clearly broken. We have asked judges to take training to understand the impact of sexual violence and trauma. They've repeatedly denied across Canada, saying that that interferes with their judicial independence. Uh, we have asked for uh, uh, sexual violence course, uh, courts where women could be uh, heavily supported throughout that, where people understood trauma, where people understood courts. That continues to be denied. So all this is happening because a judge didn't really count two jurors correctly? Absolutely. So in this case, there was two alternative jurors. And when the judge had finished uh, his summations, um, he dismissed the two alternative jurors. The technicality was there that what he should have done was randomly pick two instead of those alternatives. And this is where the system is broken. This is where the system really harms victims. If you weigh the balance of how that might affect the validity of the trial, the validity of all that testimony over the incredible harm a third trial is going to do uh, to that victim, to, to pub, uh, the public sense of safety and in the public interest, and in terms of costs. It, it absolutely makes no sense, and it has absolutely nothing to do with justice in this case. All right. Uh, Jenny Wright, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for talking to me.
The pandemic has changed a lot of our daily lives, and a by-election is no different. Things are going to look a little bit different in Humber Gross Morn when voters go to the polls. And here to tell us all about it is the head of Elections Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So give me an idea. How are things going to look different when people go into the polling places? What you'll see when you go to the polls is that we'll have additional people there. So there will probably be somebody at the door to, uh, to keep you a certain distance away from other people. So there will be stickers on the floor which will say, you know, please stand here, which will keep people socially distanced as they go across. We'll, at the poll itself, when you get up there, uh, you know, the person will be wearing a mask or a face shield, one of the two, and uh, uh, they'll ask you your name. Uh, they won't ask you to take off your mask, uh, we'll, uh, but uh, to identify you. They'll give you your ballot. You'll go behind the screen with a, uh, with a pencil. We'll give you uh, your own pencil. So in fact, you get your own personal keepsake pencil at the uh, end of voting day. That's right, you get to keep it. And you go in, mark your ballot, and then uh, you come back out, pass your ballot over to the re deputy returning office there. We'll take the counterfoils off of them and put it in the box. There'll be someone in there whose job for the day will be to uh, wipe down the area after you've gone in and voted. And then we'll uh, wipe down doorknobs and and uh, other surfaces like that that are common touch surfaces around. What about the number of polling places? Physical distancing is so important and often these are ending up in you know crowded church basements and places like that. How are you getting around that? To keep everybody apart we have to move things apart. So we have a lot more polling locations. No additional polls but additional polling locations. So if before we had four polls in a particular location and uh, now um, you know to keep everything distance we can only put two there then we'll only have two there and we'll have another location uh, where people will have to go and vote. So you may not be voting in the same location you voted in the previous general election so uh, uh, be aware of that when we send out your voter information card so if people don't feel comfortable going in person, perhaps they have an underlying health condition, for example, what options are available to them? If they feel that way, then the best way would be to vote using our mail-in ballot process, which is our special ballot process. So they could go online at Elections uh, NL and uh, download the form, uh, complete the form. Uh, they can uh, scan it and send it in with their uh, with a piece of identification and then we'll mail them out a uh, special ballot kit. We uh, put an express post return envelope in it to uh, speed up coming, coming back to us. The deadline to apply for a special ballot kit is uh, September 29th at 6 p.m. and it has to be returned very shortly after that. So uh, to get one by mail uh, around the 29th uh, would probably be questionable about whether you could get it back to us within the deadline um, because of uh, it takes a day or two to get it out in the mail and it takes a day or two to get it back so uh, you know uh, 29th you could do it in person at one of our returning offices our returning office in Parsons Pond or the uh, satellite office in Deer Lake or the uh, designated location in uh, Trout River or here at Elections uh, Newfoundland Labrador the spike of COVID-19 cases this week in other parts of the country has made the need for a vaccine all the more urgent. Today, the Prime Minister announced that Canada has signed up for one of the promising candidates. David Cochran reports. None of the vaccines being developed are ready for use, but when they are, the Prime Minister wants to make sure Canada is prepared. We've reached an agreement with AstraZeneca for the vaccine they are developing with the University of Oxford. This agreement secures up to 20 million doses for Canadians should the vaccine trials be successful. That means Canada now has deals to secure up to 282 million doses of the six leading vaccine candidates, ensuring a supply once a vaccine gets the green light stockpiling options for a way out of a pandemic that is getting worse by the day. An average of 1,175 cases have been reported daily across Canada during the most recent seven days. We are continuing to see an increase in daily case counts nationally. 
The focus remains sharply on the health crisis at home, but Trudeau is also making a big investment in the global fight against COVID, giving $440 million to a global procurement initiative to get vaccine doses for Canadians and to send millions of doses to low-income countries. This pandemic can't be solved by any one country alone, because to eliminate the virus anywhere, we need to eliminate it everywhere. None of this means vaccine doses are on the way. They still need to get through clinical trials and get regulatory approval. These deals guarantee a spot in the line that once a vaccine is ready, Canada can get its share. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. For dessert lovers, this series of paintings is a feast for the eyes, but for the artist who created them, it's food for the soul. Coming up, we'll speak with artist Barbara Pratt about why the series called Cake is a deeply emotional tribute to her mother. Well, if you have a sweet tooth, you are going to love Barbara Pratt's new series of 18 paintings. It's called 
cake. And this collection of colorful, delectable desserts is about so much more than just eye candy. And joining me now is Barbara Pratt. But before we get started, I just want to mention that the gallery is closed to the public and we're safely distanced from each other. So we took off our masks for the interview. So this series of paintings, this is deeply personal for you. Can you talk about what inspired it? My mother died in 2018, and the following February, um, when my birthday is, I realized that she wouldn't be around to make me a birthday cake, and that was very sad. But like many people who are artists, it's deep emotion that moves, moves a person to create new work, and that's how this came about. What was the connection between cake and your mom and you? Was it, was it just birthdays or was it more than that? My mom was a baker. She was not a professional at this, but she did love to bake uh, and to bake well. She was a really good cook. Um, she made obviously birthday cakes, but she also baked biscuits and uh, meringues and Christmas cakes and cookies and yeah, she was, she was very good at it. So these paintings, they, I guess they represent some sorrow for you at the sure. passing of your mother, Yes. Uh, but also some beautiful memories yeah. of her baking and the time that you spent together. Yeah, that's true. Um, none of the images actually portray my mother or me. I have no solid memory of any one thing that she baked. I don't know about you, I don't know about everybody, but I know that when you have memories of of childhood, your fond memories are often better than they actually were. Uh, you glorify things in your memory. In the painting that's behind me here uh, called Recollection of a Birthday Cake, I try to talk about how the cake that I'm trying to remember uh, was perfect. It was big and pink and, but I have a sort of a, only a faint memory, and that's why I place the cake inside of a, a foggy plastic bag. So it's like a memory that you see through, through fog, because it's not quite accurate. And like yourself, your mother was a beautiful artist. What would your mom say, do you think, about this collection? I think she'd, she'd embrace it entirely. I think that she, she would understand entirely. Um, I think she she'd be happy that we're talking about her. <laughs> she'd love that. <laughs> yeah, she would. She, she'd love that. And to represent my mom um, this way uh, is a joyful way to do it. Uh, I don't want to be sad. I don't think anybody wants to be sad, but that happens. And this is a good way to fight it. Yeah. And it's hard to feel sad when you look at such delicious looking treats. <laughs> And I can tell you, they were delicious. <laughs> well, thank you so much for telling us about this. Thank I'm you for asking about it. I'm only very hungry and I really want a cup of tea. <laughs> I know, you gotta have a cup of tea with these cakes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So beautiful. Now, we yeah. spoke a lot about uh, Barbara Pratt's mother in that conversation, but we never actually said her name. So for anyone who doesn't know, her mother is renowned artist Mary Pratt. So, yeah, if you want to view uh, Barbara Pratt's exhibition, Cake, at the Emma Butler Gallery, it's there until October 10th. Yeah, you certainly can uh, remember, you can almost see the influence there, the still life there from mother to daughter. Now I'm kind of hungry too. Now, international news to Washington we go. The body of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was laid in state today at the U.S. Capitol building. The highly respected judge died of cancer last week. She was 87. At a memorial service, the woman known as RBG was remembered as a fighter for everyone. CBC's Ellen Morrow has more now on what was a very somber day in Washington. Ready, stop! Ruth Bader Ginsburg's casket arriving on Capitol Hill, the first woman ever to lie in state there. Ginsburg trailblazing even in death. It is with profound sorrow and deep sympathy to the Ginsburg family that I have the high honor to welcome Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg to lie in state in the capital of the United States. Opera, Ginsburg's favorite genre, filled Statuary Hall, where loved ones and politicians, including presidential candidate Joe Biden, paid their respects. 
Today's ceremony caps a week of mourning for Ginsburg, a liberal icon lauded for her lifelong fight for gender equality and civil rights. As a lawyer, she won equality for women and men, not in one swift victory, but brick by brick, case by case. A fight that must continue, said Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt. Today we stand in sorrow, and tomorrow we the people must carry on Justice Ginsburg's legacy. Even as our hearts are breaking, we must rise with her strength and move forward. Ginsburg's strength was physical too, known for staying fit despite age and illness, calling her trainer one of the most important people in her life. Today, that trainer, Bryant Johnson, did push-ups beside Ginsburg's casket, a fitting, if unconventional, goodbye. Ready, step. And as Ginsburg's casket was carried away, female lawmakers looked on, a final farewell for a fierce champion of the American woman. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dying wish was reportedly not to be replaced until after the election, but it's unlikely to be granted. President Trump is set to announce a nominee for Ginsburg's seat tomorrow, with Republicans ready to push ahead with confirmation before Election Day. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington.
Time to see who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries now. Happy 60th anniversary greetings to Hector and Jean Earl from St. Lunaire Gricket. They're celebrating in Goose Bay. Happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Eugene and Millie Young from Beachside. Happy 51st anniversary to Roland and Myrtle Hodder from Rock Harbor who celebrated last Sunday. And today, Kathy and Frank Purchase in Botwood are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. On Wednesday, Howard and Lorna Shepard in Lark Harbor celebrated their 58th. Happy anniversary today to Ross and Linda Diamond in Gander. Happy 51st anniversary to Robert and Bonnie Coates of Glenwood. Carl and Marion Gillett from Happy Valley Goose Bay are celebrating their 60th anniversary. Wishing George and Gladys Chalk of Noggin Cove a happy 55th anniversary. 55th anniversary wishes going out to Alan and Willie Loader in Summerside. Happy 50th anniversary today to Catherine and Dennis Norman in Bellevue. Happy 58th anniversary to Jake and Violet King in Broad Cove, Conception Bay. Congratulations to David and Mae Butt in Carboneer. They're celebrating 57 years together. Rose and Burt Reynolds of Old Perlican are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 57th anniversary last Sunday to Ed and Shirley Rowe in Chance Cove. Happy 51st anniversary tomorrow to Max and Diane Perry in Lumsden. Norman and Mary Ryan of Southern Harbor celebrated their 53rd anniversary on Wednesday in Rashoon. This Sunday, Stuart and Laura Pye from Lodge Bay, Labrador will celebrate their 55th anniversary. Roy and Marie Anthony from Pillies Island celebrated their big 65th anniversary on Monday. Roy is a Korean War veteran. Happy 55th anniversary to Ross and Juanita Ledru in Boyd's Cove. Happy 54th anniversary to Emma and Gerald Matthews of Wareham. Happy 50th anniversary today to Chess and Irene Stone of Upper Island Cove, Conception Bay. Happy 52nd anniversary to Fred and Teresa Collins of Winterland. Ed and Jen Kenny from Port Kerwin are celebrating their 54th anniversary. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Charlie and Suzanne Dennis of Mary. Town. Happy 54th anniversary to Frank and Linda Ward of Gambo. Happy 56th anniversary to Mamie and Eugene Newman of Southbrook. And here's a triple greeting. Congratulations to Marie and Charlie White of Cornerbrook, who are celebrating their 92nd and 94th birthdays and also recently celebrated their 69th anniversary. Okay, the trifecta. Greetings to Alice <laughs> and Stanley Chasson of Cape St. George, who are celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary. And happy 50th to Dave and Myra Taylor in South River. Congratulations as well to Cyril and Ruth Kirby of Deer Lake on their 50th anniversary. And today marks a big 64th anniversary for Robert and Minnie Gulledge in Kelligrews. Happy 90th birthday to Ruby Guy of Brighton, now living in Clark's Beach. Tomorrow, Ira Troke in Gander will celebrate his 99th birthday. Happy 93rd birthday to Marianne Skinner in Lourdes. Birthday wishes going out to Jesse Payne from Cowhead, who's turning 94. Happy birthday to Nellie Bartlett from Colliers, who celebrated her 90th birthday. Happy 93rd birthday to Winnie Rose from Ochre Pit Cove. Big day is tomorrow. And happy 90th birthday tomorrow as well to Lauren Hines from Bay Vert. Happy 90th birthday to Primus Pittman in Bird Cove. And on Monday, Myrtle Oxford from Springdale celebrated her 92nd birthday. And happy 91st birthday to Ralph Coombs from Head Bay, Beta Spare. Happy birthday to Muriel Moulton of Winterland who celebrated her 93rd birthday yesterday. Another fine crowd. Yeah. Yes, congratulations, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, Friday, and it looks like a beautiful weekend coming. Yep. It is looking stunning for the last weekend in September, for sure. Hitting the 20 degree mark in some cases. Whoa. I'll take it. Yep. Chance to golfing, right? <laughs> hey, you know, I haven't done that yet this year. Maybe that's something I'll do this weekend. Oh, good time to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and get out to enjoy some of that uh, beautiful weather. Yep. See you on Monday. Good night.